this morning we have with us Chad Ratliff. Chad is a district administrator for Albemarle County Public Schools, which serves about 14,000 students in 26 different school facilities, located over 700 square miles surrounding Charlottesville, Virginia. His work focuses on seeding and expanding the district's portfolio of non-traditional learning experiences such as maker-centered learning, customized pathways, STEAM, and entrepreneurial opportunities across the K-12 curriculum as part of the district's emphasis on student agency and lifelong learning. He has represented this work at the White House on several occasions, presented for the National Science Foundation and U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, is frequently invited to speak on these topics across the country and has written for Edutopia, Ed Surge, and other national publications. In fact, I first met Chad all the way over in California when we met at the Maker Ed convening this past summer. Chad earned his master's degree in education from the University of Virginia and his MBA from Virginia Tech. He's also an alumnus of the University of Virginia's Darden School of Business Executive Educators Leadership Institute. Today, he's going to be sharing with us um, his talk on radical transformation on making school by design. So without further ado, I'll welcome Chad up to the podium. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Chad Ratliff, uh, and thank you, Jamie, for that warm introduction. I really appreciate this, and I, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, and it seems like uh, just, uh, just last week we were in California, but um, when you said over the summer, I'm realizing how, how quickly time is flying by. Um, it is an honor and a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate it. I'm very excited uh, to be talking at you know, an institute of higher learning like James Madison on something like making. Um, I do want to offer a quick warning. I'm not a professional speaker, not even close. Uh, I'm a practicing educator, administrator, and teacher uh, with a day job. I probably work a little too hard. And uh, so I do this uh, because it is, is my honor to share the work of a team uh, of passionate, brilliant educators, some of whom are coming in now. Look, there they are. <laughs> the two seats there, I said. Uh, and then I'll have a couple more coming later today. But I am not a professional speaker. Uh, so it's going to be very difficult, A, because of that, uh, and B, because there's no way that I can do justice to what our learning community, our teachers and administrators and students and parents and and the folks that you'll meet later today uh, are doing on behalf of children. But I can only promise I'll give it my best. Uh, as you know, there's the, the hashtag that Jamie mentioned. This presentation uh, is directly linked on Bitly, capital letters there, so you have access to it immediately. Um, and I tried to link things uh, throughout the presentation so you can have it and take it with you. The downside of that is, uh, there's, there's a little bit of, um, of conflict between Google Slides that move to PowerPoint on a PC and this equipment, but luckily Maddie is here. Uh, she's helping uh, with some hacks and workarounds on, on those things. So I do have a couple videos that I'll share with you, and, and Maddie will help uh, with those transitions. I do want to point out, uh, as I mentioned, this is Stephanie Passman and Eric Bretter that just came in. Uh, two Two teachers, or one librarian and a teacher, will be joining them later today. Uh, they will be talking about unmaking school, a view from the classroom. So I'm going to go high and stay in the clouds a little bit and try to challenge some assumptions and talk about what we believe. Uh, but then later today, we'll be together with, with the folks that are seeing what's happening as a result of these changes and these ideas uh, on the ground with students. Um, 
Gabby and, and May couldn't be here until a little later in the morning. I tried to tell Stephanie and Eric to, uh, uh, to, to not get up so early too, but uh, I was, uh, Stephanie responded with, Chad, we're not there to see you. <laughs> we're, we're there for the free bre breakfast. Uh, so, you me <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's start, you know, if you ever do one of these or attend one of these in Charlottesville or at UVA, you're going to be met with a quote from Jefferson. So I'm going to return the favor and we're going to talk a little bit about Madison. And if you're a student in the public schools of Virginia, this is what you're going to know. This is essential knowledge of Madison. He's a great note taker. <laughs> he was very skilled at compromise. In Madison, this is, so, so until you're about 13 years old, this is what you're going to know about Madison. This is what's most important about Madison. And now, are there any K-12 history teachers in the room? There's one. So as you know, Madison shows up a little bit later. You know, you'll see him again in Virginia, U.S., and then, and then ultimately at the end of your uh, public school experience into government standards, which is basically this with a couple more bullet points. And that's important to note because the only way that we can document through our current modality of schooling that you know this information is that you'll take some test and it'll say, well, uh, who was the father of the Constitution? Was it A, Thomas Jefferson, or B, James Madison? B. Or if it's really tricky, it might say, why was Madison called the father of the Constitution? And you might say, well, he was good at conflict resolution, but they'll trick you because it might not say he was also a really great note taker. But this is what Madison believed, and what folks don't know and what's not uh, widely known about Madison is that he was actually a, a strong advocate for public schooling, even though it took a while to get it moving in Virginia. Um, Madison was definitely an advocate for it. Uh, this is from a, a letter that he wrote to a Kentucky legislator when Kentucky, Kentucky was struggling with, how do they take public schooling down into the primary levels? Uh, and he writes, what spectacle can be more edifying or more seasonable than that of liberty and learning, each leaning on the other for their mutual and surest support? And surely he was talking about from a societal level, from the country perspective. Uh, but think about this from the, from the individual perspective. And it's surely the way that we learn about Madison was in no way the way Madison learned about the world and learned how to think. Donald Robertson came over from Scotland. He was highly educated and enlightened individualist. He came to the colonies, like so many others, to seek a fortune, uh, but to also freely teach his beliefs and in independent thought. He was heavily influenced by Locke's essay concerning human understanding, which some might argue John Locke was the, the true father of progressive education. Madison was homeschooled by his mother until he was age 11. And then he goes to the Donald Robertson School, which was for the elites uh, to get this kind of enlightenment education as it is today. In molding, the essay, Molding a Founding Father, Robertson was described as an extraordinary teacher and likely the first to expose the minds of his pupils to the ideas of the Enlightenment, the political questions of the age, the classics, and the boundless capabilities of the human spirit. How many here today can say that about a teacher that they had in their career? I can. I had, I had a, a couple. How many people here today, how many teachers do we have in the room? K-12. Higher ed. Teacher educators. Students. Everybody. Everybody. <laughs> right? Uh, I'm a teacher. If I ask myself, do I do this? Have I done this to someone? I hope so. But it's a hard, it's a hard question. It's a challenging question. But at the end of Madison's career, he says, all that I have been in life, I owe largely to that man. This picture 
I took from my phone standing inside Montpelier from the library where Madison researched and wrote what later became the Constitution and other influential papers. I wondered, it was a, I, I got yelled at for taking this picture, by the way, but <laughs> I, I, I took it anyway, and I couldn't help but wonder at that time what was running through his mind as he looked out that window, across those mountains, across that field, landscaping probably was a little different. But what was running through his mind? What was he thinking about? He essentially invented a government. He, he, he formed it in his mind based on some things he knew and some ideas that he had, and then he actualized it. He made it real. And that's what makers do. And he received one type of education. But there are two fundamental types of education. Whether we want to talk about Wilson speaking to the New York City Teachers Association that we want one class of persons to have a liberal education, and we want another class, a very much larger class of necessity in every society to forego the privileges of a liberal education and fit themselves to perform specific, difficult, manual tasks. Or it was Elwood Coverley that my presentation didn't refresh itself, who said, <laughs> Children should be put through a machine to the specifications set forth by a higher body. Elwood Coverley was the dean of the Stanford School of Education at that time and led sort of the, in the education wars of the early 1900s. He led the traditionalists versus John Dewey and the progressives and ultimately won. As we all know, we still have that model in schools today. Later today, you're going to hear from Mark. Uh, who's going to talk about maker movement writ large, the associated technologies, its impact on society, its history, and things like that. So to avoid redundancy, I'm only going to talk about it in the educational context. The first thing we need to note is this is not a fad. This is not a wholly new idea. This builds on the work of Locke, of Dewey, of Montessori, John Holt, the critical pedagogy of Illich, Freire, and others, to see more Papert. But they were far, far ahead of their time. But this is a new opportunity. And there are some changes that allow this type of learning, this type of schooling, even, to move forward. From the White House, this is President Obama talking about, at the, at a, the White House Maker Fair, talking about uh, maker education. Lots and lots coming out of D.C. around that to popular media, certainly in the educational media. You can't get an email from any association that's not talking about this. MIT a couple years ago announced that they're accepting maker portfolios as a supplement to their admissions process using the word maker. The National Science Foundation writes that the maker approach encourages people to understand how things work, to experiment, invent, redesign things through multiple iterations, to democratize and understand processes of engineering, science innovation, and to commercialize new products. It's all about STEM. It's all about innovating and engineering. But Scientific American is actually noting just a few weeks ago that the opposite is true. Agency by Design is a research unit at Harvard studying maker-centered learning, and what they are noticing is that while innovation and STEM tend to be the buzzwords associated with the maker movement, when you talk to maker educators, as you'll hear from throughout the day, working in schools and maker spaces, the real news is that kids are learning about collaboration, about community, about complexity, and about themselves, and that's what we're seeing and we're experiencing as well. Uh, but since we are at a teaching and learning with technology conference, let's talk a little bit about technology. I do want to make a note. It's said that technology is neutral. We've all heard that before, that you can, you can use a hammer to build a house or you could crush someone's skull with it. But I say educational technology is a little bit different. Educational technology comes with a bias built in. Educational technology can be used to reinforce, intensify, and perpetuate obedience-focused education, or it can be used to amplify and unleash a child's potential. 
And we've heard this story over the years, how technology is going to save education. From the radio, the phonograph, Edison said would replace teachers. The TV will replace teachers. The computer labs will replace teachers. The laptop, untethered, can replace teachers and revolutionize education. We've changed our chalkboards and our whiteboards into interactive whiteboards, going to revolutionize education. And now we see images of children staring at 3D printers. Revolutionizing education is changing the focus of education from the dominant teaching wall, from me as the authoritarian to the child, the learner, as one who's empowered. 3D printers are no better than, than a paper printer. If all we're doing with them is printing a chess piece and letting kids look in amazement at what's happening, maybe that gets them excited about something, but the, the action is happening on the design side. The printer is powerful only when it's printing, making physical the ideas of a child. The origin of the input comes from the head of a child. And just one simple question that I, that this is just me, that I've over the years have developed in my mind is can this technology amplify the capability of the child and is it being used in that way? In those images that we saw, the computers and the laptops and the things, no, they weren't being used in that way, but they have a capability to. And it was Pappert who said the role of the teacher is to create the conditions for invention rather than provide the ready-made, uh, provide ready-made knowledge. And Pappert's notion of construction, uh, constructionism was also way ahead of its time. But now we have some modern affordances that make from Locke to Dewey and Montessori through Freire to uh, Pappert and now today and, and those are particularly we have the world's content in our pocket. It's a hell of a lot easier to be a self-directed learner facilitated by an adult uh, and to ultimately become an autodidact when you have the world's content in your pocket. It doesn't mean it's good. You have to know what to do with it and you have to have communities to help you with that. Physical computing and rapid prototyping make me and another, a couple people, a couple kids, a couple seventh graders, a couple elementary kids, the ability to do and to invent and to prototype things what it took corporations to do just 10 years ago. And that's our opportunity. You heard a little bit about uh, Albemarle County, 26 schools were over 700 square miles and we are in the top three of U.S. counties in the country with regard to income inequality. People tend to think that Albemarle is this, um, you know, we surround Charlottesville with this wealthy, uh, and there is a concentration of wealth in Albemarle County, uh, but that's not all that's there. And it's also important to note that this is a 10-year journey that we've been on. We didn't decide two years ago that we were going to be a maker district or we're going to catch this maker, uh, the latest fad. We started with, about a decade ago, our lifelong learner competencies. And this is our common core. And there are 12 of them. And they are here for you to see. And ultimately what they do is if we can get through these, uh, when kids leave Alamora County, they've learned how to learn, not what to learn. They've learned life. But this was accelerated by the maker education phenomenon, which we tend to believe allows us to reconceptualize the public schooling experience. It started uh, formally with us about three years ago when we prototype ourselves, uh, and we took our, our most traditional learning environment, which is the summer school, elementary summer school for at-risk uh, students that weren't achieving. And we turned those, completely flipped them into um, maker academies. This is a quick video. Again, it's now three years old. Uh, but I want you to listen, particularly pay close attention to what the students are saying. This was filmed by one of the teachers who was working on this. It was a joint project with four elementary schools. <laughs>
Maddie. Thank you. <laughs> we're also reimagining, sorry, we're also, my lecture. we're also reimagining uh, the high school experience too. This is Josh. Josh uh, was one of our most troubled uh, youth who found himself just a couple months ago at the White House uh, because of a program uh, that we initiated at the high school called Team 19, which went completely interdisciplinary, trying to engage students um, who just traditional model of schooling wasn't working for them. Josh goes to the White House. He's invited to talk about that, the, next, the summit on the next generation of high schools. He gives a speech. He tells a story and was the only standing ovation at the end of the day. Anyone who knows Josh knows that if someone would have told him or anyone who knew him that he was going to be in the white, at the White House in, even in just a few months, much less a year or so, he would have been laughed at, ridiculed. This is a, another group of teachers and administrators that are coming together partially in response to the VDOE uh, changes of, of high school coming down, but we're thinking how do we reconceptualize the high school experience to look more like what you just heard. We believe making democratizes access to the time, space, tools, materials, and community necessary for creative production and invention. These are what we call music construction studios that we have on the periphery of every library in our secondary schools, middle and high. They have, I would argue, uh, been the catalyst uh, to really engage students uh, just with the interest, in some cases, to come to school. The high school principal, that the, the original one, and May Craddock, who's a library, uh, was a real linchpin in our library transitions across the division. She'll be here uh, in, a, in, in a little while, but also in the session later today with Stephanie and Eric. Uh, the principal made a joke that before they went down this path and started building out spaces for kids 
uh, to access when they wanted to. He used to, when he first became prince, would have to go up the street to the, to the strip mall. There's a food line and some other the subway and some other things up there, and he had to wrangle these kids to come back to school every day. Now, those kids are still skipping classes, but they're in the library, or they're in Eric's space. Or they're somewhere in school doing things that are important to them that then they may be able to take into their classes. This is a middle school lab, high school lab. This is a great student-run, student-organized uh, radio station that's just emerging this year at one of our high schools. We believe maker education starts with the child. that they bring in their interests, their backgrounds, their own enthusiasm. This is a story of Nick. You'll hear from him maybe in a video in a, in a few minutes. Uh, Nick originated, uh, his idea originated in a middle school summer school transition that was sort of following up on the heels of what you saw at the elementary schools. Um, and actually, Eric led that. Uh, and it, he, he designed an entire several week experience a lot of thought went into a process, but what the kids heard on the first day was essentially, what do you want to make? Well, Nick was, was a baseball player, and he wanted to make a better umpire, as so many of us do. Uh, <laughs> and that's, that's kind of what he did. He, he, built a, you know, he built a contraption that could detect balls and strikes. Um, which landed uh, Nick and Eric at the White House. Uh, this is a, a small prototype of his project. He, he later went on to, uh, he has a patent. He has won several, he won a startup weekend and things like that, and it's still unfolding. It's still unfolding. He's now working with some computer science folks at the University of Virginia, putting the final touches on, uh, on the Arduino programming. We think making brings content to context. And that's very different. That's very different. We talk a lot about project-based learning, or it's, which usually means project-oriented learning. You learn something that's told at you, and then you go make a macaroni plate or something. And they all look exactly the same. And it's arguable whether that was even helpful. Maddie, can you do your magic on this one? This is, I want to see a short clip. Um, from this video, Edutopia visited us last summer. So you'll see the, the difference between um, an Edutopia produced video and no, notice what they show in the very beginning uh, and then one that, that a teacher did that I showed you a few minutes ago. But the message is still good. Ah, the 3D printer. We're staring at it. This is our superintendent speaking.
And we think making is hands-on and minds-on, which is an important distinction. This is a project that that happened at one of our most rural middle schools. Uh, We worked with a a former Charlottesville resident, he went to UVA, lives in Philadelphia now, um, Alex Gilliam, he runs a little nonprofit called Public Workshop, and what he does is he works with kids across the country and they build and make something uh, in the public interest. Um, you might imagine benches or uh, shelters for bus stops or things like that. But he was in town. He brought him home for a few weeks, and he worked with one of our middle schools that wanted to reconceptualize seating in the cafeteria. And what we thought would come from that would be maybe some benches or some booths or, or something like that. But as the process began to unfold, what they decided was they wanted tree houses. And the first thing you do to build a tree house is go get some trees. And so what we ended up with were these two giant tree houses uh, inside this cafeteria. They have pulleys to bring your trays up and things like that. And they wanted to make sure that they were on wheels. So we were thinking, hold on, I don't know if this is a good idea. <laughs> so we used to talk to our liability people and all this. Uh, and what happened was well, they would have to tear the tree houses down and build them back and rebuild, and they were iterating through it. And so we finally said, well, let's, do, let's make this. What if we were building something like this? So, so we, we introduced the facilities folks to them and some builders, and they brought in, and they, they had to build it to specifications. So they're real. They're actual things that exist still in the school day. I've been there. There are other classes sitting in these things, doing things, writing poetry, all sorts of things. We think making empowers the learner. This is Iowate. Iowate uh, is, is, in, is in our engineering program, High School Engineering Academy, and what she recognized when she got there was that, you know what, middle school girls really need some kind of experience that opens their eyes to engineering in a non-engineering way, because that's what, what I, she was missing. So she, she approached her teacher and said, you know what I, I want to do? I want to do a summer camp for middle school girls uh, and I spent a lot of time over on the Rivanna River, and it's hard to access this really beautiful part, and I'd really like to build a bridge to that, to make that part more accessible. So the teacher said, sure, well, let's do this. And so that's what she did. And she engaged these girls around this activity. It's in now in its second year running, and she did the entire thing. And then you see she, too, is uh, educating policymakers in D.C. of what high school should be about. This is Autumn. Quick, quick words from Autumn. Autumn was part of a summer academy that we ran with support from the DOE that we would add credit to the making process, Design, Make, Launch Academy was what it was called. Every child earned a, a, a credit in entrepreneurship, some earned a credit in a content area. And she was right. There's Autumn testing out her swing, and here's a teacher 
uh, that checked it out and said, Dr. Jesse Turner, the principal of the school, can we replace desks with Autumn's couch swings at Monticello? Can get a good deal. This will be the last, the last clip. I have to show this, though. I'll just let, let you watch it. I agree. <laughs> this is another image. This is Henry. It looks like the Situation Room at the White House. And it is at the White House. And here's an eighth grader. He's invented so many things. I don't know what in the hell he's doing. It. But I know that he has some of the, the national leaders in the educational policy listening to him. Making can't be a special event in a special place at a special time only for certain kids. Right now it's unfolding as, well, this is only, this is new vocational education to teach kids skills. Or, or it's only for the gifted kids. Huge conversation around that right now. Um, it has to be, we have to continue moving toward a process that making maker education is a pedagogy, one in which the learner is empowered during the school day throughout the school day, after the school day. This is an English language arts classroom. It is an approach to learning. It's not about 3D printing, although there is a 3D printer in there. But you can see, just in this image alone, you can see where the power is, where the choice is, just from where they're sitting, how they're sitting, and what they're doing. Whenever I go in there, whether they're writing poetry or, or whatever it is, it's, there's ne they, don't, they don't even notice you when you walk through that room because they're doing what's important to them, facilitated by a skillful teacher. Content is not at all missing. It's very much alive. Or whether it's making drama, making theater, student-led, student-designed, now student-written performances. And I won't show this. I think I'm out of time. Right, Jamie? Getting close. Um, this, is, this was kind of long. This is, I'll, I'll say this. Please watch it. Um, this is Julian. This is a couple weeks ago at New York Maker Fair. Julian uh, gave a five-minute, which turned into a seven-minute Ignite talk at the Maker Education Forum in New York. I, I knew Julian was going. I helped facilitate that process to get him there. I had no idea what he's going to say. And I was actually a little nervous about what he might say. Uh, but we didn't want to control it. So uh, we let him say it. Julian, like Josh at the White House, Julian was the only speaker that day uh, to which the crowd responded with a standing ovation. I do encourage you to watch that when you can. And I end with this. Even though the windows may look different in some ways, the question that we have to leave here with and wrestle with today is how might we ensure that every child has an open window to the boundless capabilities of the human spirit? Thank you. I linked some articles and references and resources and things uh, on here for you. I could, do we, do you want to, do you want me to do any questions? Can I bring up Stephanie and Eric? Stephanie Passman, elementary school teacher, Eric Bretter, now high school teacher. You saw Eric in the videos. Um, these folks are very open source, we all are, so if you have something at the 3 o'clock that you need to go see and uh, something else, we're, we're always available, you 
you have their Twitter handles and our emails and we're easily accessible. But any questions? I know, I know which one will come up. Maybe you should ask it because they're not. No. <laughs> no? The question that, that I would say would come up was how do you assess it? Anybody wondering that? Yeah. And that is a, that's a, that's, that is a big topic, and, and I bring that up because there are lots of ways you can assess it, but it's something that particularly this group, we have to be thinking about. We have to be serious about this. We have to get it right this time. Assessment is one of those things. Restructuring the cells and bells model is another thing. But we have to get serious about how we're looking at this. We know what's happening. It's happening across the country in schools that are, that are taking advantage of public schools. It's been happening forever in elite schools, uh, in some types of elite schools, for those who can afford twenty to thirty, forty thousand dollars a year. But we think all kids should have access to this. And we think that this type of education draws out the gift, giftedness in every child. So I encourage you and there's some writing, I linked to some, about assessing maker education. But I encourage you to be very thoughtful about this and be very thoughtful about the approach to this. And if you believe in something like this, that this is a type of education that we should be considering, then go all in on it. This is not an anti-intellectual anti anti movement. Uh, I'm anti-intellectual. <laughs> um, but let's all work together on this, please. Thank you. Are the materials and all the tools built into your district-wide budget, or do you guys get grants? How do you maintain all the materials you from the district? All of the above. Um, most of it's repurposing and rethinking existing budgets. Um, a lot of this is done on the cheap. Um, those are definitely questions we could talk about you know, later today in, in some of our approaches to do that, but you know, the 3D, you have some high dollar items, laser cutters and things like that, but when you're thinking about making as it's a pedagogy, as in stands toward learning, you don't have to have those materials. Uh, they certainly can accelerate, you know, and, and intensify, amplify the child's capability in some cases, but remember, it's all about the design side. Someone asked me if they were starting a makerspace, what one item they would have to have. Like, what do we have to get first? And I always say cardboard. So there's my budget. Go to the grocery store and ask for lots of old boxes. I'm thankful for that budget. <laughs> That's a good question. Well, the one, one thing, and I'll, 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 I would love for, for one of these to answer that question, but, but I'll preface it with you can't mandate agency. I can't make someone give someone else power, right? Uh, and, and the problem is, and most of us in this room, by, by, by judging by the show of hands, is that we're all very, or I, I wasn't, I limped through, um, barely, uh, <laughs> as you know, particularly in the younger days. Uh, my education, but, but we are products of the system that worked for us, whether we tolerated it or, or we took advantage of it, however, or we loved it, maybe, maybe we loved it. Um, so I think that it's a challenge for us to think about it, doing something radically different. Uh, but in terms of, from the teacher perspective, I'd love for one of these guys to... I think the best advocate for this type of education is Hey, we were doing this cool thing in class over here. Uh, I don't like sitting down and listening to you talk for an hour and a half. What's going on? <laughs> um, you know, it kind of jars the teacher, like, oh, what am I doing? And I've had a lot of teachers as a result of those conversations with the kids now being more comfortable. And I often encourage children to, like, ask your teacher, like, this didn't make sense to me, and in a nice way. <laughs> and, but the teachers will then start to come back and, like, look at my space. I also don't have a physical wall in my room which is really cool. So it's like, it's there, you can't deny it. So it's kind of like those things, like I'm very transparent, I reach out to teachers when I see a cool connection, and teachers like me do that. We invite them to events and things like that, so they either choose or not. But when the kid comes to you and says like, do you think I could build this, or do you think I could try this? Um, it's really just getting the teacher to say, yeah, give it a shot.
I like it, yes. And, uh, and I think that's when a lot of the transformation happens. How do you balance this with SOLs that are so common in Zoom? They are pretty common. Uh, so <laughs> Chad used one of his phrases in his presentation about embedding content into student context. So there isn't an either or, it, it is both. And we have these things that are must do's and as kids start creating and designing, I think that if you're a master of your content as a teacher, if you have that stuff nailed down, I mean we were sitting planning this presentation, I was like, Chad, you know what our fourth graders have to know about James <laughs> Madison? Like it's garbage. But, uh, <laughs> So I mean, like I know every SOL, K5. So when I'm having a conversation with a kid about what they're creating, I can easily start plugging in math and uh, measurement or science, what's happening, what's this movement going on, how does this work with force and motion. So if as educators, we are really competent in the things that we know our teachers have, or I'm sorry, our students have to know at the end of a given school year, then we can push that into the things that are already important to them. It means our curriculum map and our lesson plans might look a little messy because you have to trust yourself and the kids to get to that point. Yeah, I'll just add on, it's interesting to watch kids like bring in a worksheet or a study for a test or something and talk to them about what they're doing and have a wonderful five minute conversation during lunch or something when I just have like a bunch of kids. And that conversation they'll report back is like, that was really useful. Thanks for like helping me think about it like that. And it's just that shift in like, why are you learning this? As opposed to, you need to learn this. Um, I think is like the first step in getting the kids that, into that like direction. Um, but finding out that teachers can like come back and be like, hey, that project was really cool. The kids really enjoyed it. How do we do more? And the kids not learning like A, B, C, D, or this, that, this sentence, this standard, this thing. But they're able to like reflect on the whole picture. So they can just apply and think and apply and think. So when anything comes their way, they have that skill, not the knowledge, maybe, if that makes sense. Thank you so much.